welcome on behalf of Cambridge Common Writers. Uh, my name is Michael Mercurio for the two or three of you who don't already know me. I am the executive director of Cambridge Common Writers. We are a voluntary organization uh, that is an alumni organization for graduates and friends of Leslie's low res MFA program in creative writing. And if you go to cambridgecommonwriters.org, which I will drop in the chat a little bit later when I'm not talking, um, you will find on our website all sorts of fun information about what we do as an organization. You'll find bios and headshots of the writers that have become active members of Cambridge Common Writers. You'll find information on the faculty mentors that we worked with at Leslie. And you'll find a treasure trove of resources, including videos of other events that Cambridge Common Writers has sponsored, much like we are sponsoring and hosting this event tonight for Lily Poetry Review. So with that being said, it's my distinct pleasure to see you all here tonight and to hand things over to Christine Jones, who will be chatting about the anthology and giving us the order of business for the evening. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. It's actually really, um, as I was going through the poems, and, and this is one reason why we're opening up, Robbie, with you, but just particularly speaking, like a, we're like, a, what, a year plus later after sort of responding and writing to these poems, and I found it so interesting to read them now and, and, and remembering sort of how it was then. And this was exactly what I wanted, what we wanted, Eileen and I, when we talked about putting an anthology, an anthology together, was that this would be a, a record of, of sort of what we were feeling. And, and that's why I love anthologies, frankly, and it's a collection of many voices. It's not just one poet's voice, but many and various experiences. So this is what we have. I'm so excited that there's so many of our Leslie Posse here. Um, that's just been such a pleasure to work with all of you. And then how the anthology went on with Cindy Hunter Morgan's MSU Filmetry Festival, that just was, has been incredible. Um, we went on and, and did an event at Mass Poetry Festival. We're hoping that we'll be able to actually um, also speak at the AWP Festival. We've put forward a proposal there. Um, so that's been wonderful. We got to hear Stephen Kramer read his poem in full length, which was an event in of itself. That was just a treasure. Not um, tonight, though. I know, not tonight. We won't be able to get that whole time in. But you are spared. Right. So this is this has just been such a um, just wonder to to be able to work with all of you in this context. And again, thanks for being here. But Robbie, I wanted to start with you because your poem in particular, first of all, the language, the, the language that stood out to me, the choice of words was, was the word ill-timed, right? The ill-timed snow globe for me was such a vivid and, and, and also, I'm not going to say shocking, it wasn't shocking, but it was just that really like gut punch from that the use of language there, specifically with snow globe. And just to read your poem now, this is the one that really stood out to me and how now we are re-emerging and a bit haphazardly. I mean, I feel like it's still a little odd. I don't know how all of you feel, but sort of going out in the world right now and you have your mask and you wear it, you don't wear it, it's tucked in your pocket. It's a little, still a, a little bit unsettling for me anyways, just to sort of know how to move about. Um, and yet it's freeing, you know, and we, and, and to have to wear, we were, I actually had to travel for a memorial service and being on the airport and wearing it, you know, for multiple hours. And it felt like back in that suffocating stage, I was like, my gosh, we've been wearing these. And then we kind of have had a some time of not wearing it. And then I was like, oh, I'm wearing it. And okay. So let's move forward because we want to have time for everything. And Robbie, I just, before you read your poem, I would love it if you could just speak to how you feel about then and now. Oh, well, thanks, Christina. Thank, thank you, Christina and Eileen, for this project. It's been it's been such a wonderful kind of I mean, a companion through this whole journey to sort of know that I've been sort of traveling through it with 
you know, all, all of the people who've been part of this anthology. Um, it really feels like extended family. And the, you know, the times we've been isolated, it's sort of nice to know that, that we've all been sort of thinking and writing and, and have had this, this venue to share um, our writing together. So thank you so much for the work that you put into that. And, and I'm thrilled that Cambridge Common Writers is able to, to do this tonight. Um, yeah, I, um, so just a, a back, the background to the poem is I, um, my wife and I bought a place in Vermont in January of 2020. Just, just weeks before COVID became a reality. And a, a couple of months later when and I was, I, I, I'd been working as a clinician and I sort of aged out of being able to do frontline clinical work. And so it, it sort of made sense to, to come up and, and be in Vermont for, for when the lockdown happened. And we, so I was up here um, very isolated and with this big orchard, um, apple orchard that was part of the property that we had um, had to learn how to deal with. and. Um, so I, I'll, I think I'll just, I'll read the poem and then sort of talk about you know, the before and the after afterwards. Um, it's called, it's short, COVID Obad. It's a freak May flurry and the orchard swirls like an ill-timed snow globe. Our tiny world contained and precious, interrupted now only by inscrutable daylights and apple buds hung, huddle swollen and confused beneath their sheathings, assaulted by these cold alien particles. Don't you wonder, when will we know how to emerge? So, um, yeah, it's it, it's it, it, the, the the feeling was I, I, reading the poem now. I realized sort of you know how, how small and obscured the world felt at, you know in that moment, um, and I mean the, sort of a, a snowstorm in May is sort of a strange thing, which sort of paralleled the you know the um, you know the the virus you know, swirling through and and um, you know it, for you know, this this is the first time I'd experienced the orchard bearing fruit and it was our first season there and we didn't understand what was you know, what would, what would happen or what was supposed to happen you know and you know, with the snow be, you know, how vulnerable the buds would be to all of this and it turned out most of them survived and most of us survived and you know, some some of us didn't um, and I, I guess now it, you know, it's sort of in, in, in going through another seasonal cycle and having a, a deeper understanding of what goes on in this land. And, and now we have a deeper understanding of the, vi the virus and you know, how we relate to it and, and what we do and don't need to do. Although, I mean, we're still struggling with it. Um, you know, there still are risks. Each season has its risks. Um, but I think perhaps we're, we're, we're moving slowly towards uh, things being more knowable. Um, but it is really helpful for me to remember just you know, I mean, the snow, the snow globe image of like how contained we were in, in our bubbles, you know, where, whether it was in the city or in a, in a rural setting, um, just um, how, um, how it, it containing that was and, and how now we're, now we are emerging and, and it's, it's, it, it's not clear all yet, but, it, but it, I feel like we're moving in, in, a, in a direction. I guess that, that's what I mostly have to say. Thank you, Robbie. Thank you so much, Robbie. Um, and next up will be John Lee. And John, I'm very taken with your poem, Plague Anatomy. It's so textured and um, imagistic, sophisticated. And I'm especially taken with the idea of hang fire that um, delay between the ignition of a firearm and the release of the propellant and how that's a metaphor for the delay between exposure to COVID and the infection. And also I was quite, quite taken with um, the bodies in this lyric being washed and anointed and released to the river um, and being touched, which is so moving during the isolation um, and this poem also notes the folly of glamorizing one age over another. Um, how do you think COVID-19 pandemic led you to write this sweeping narrative? So excellent question, Eileen, uh, as always, of course, and thank you for obviously piecing apart a very <clears throat> intricate and detailed poem for me. Uh, I, I think I'm going to take in, in part the 
trajectory that Robbie did and, and read the poem first so that it's sort of hanging there before the answer is present. And then I'll go back through and, and piece together a number of things that I was thinking about uh, in the poem. So this is Plague Anatomy. The idiocy of valuing the standards of an age against another as if telos, as if a nascent rifted margin kept the present unprofanable. And also the measured necessity, lest the ethanol garble of mastery, a rudderless cargo ship foundered and bled out, streams of Prosecco awash through a hull rift and smeared with oil slick, a runnel of rainbow excretion for coral to filter and sea bass to gill suck and sink to the scavenger's strip. The faith of believers who hold up their rulers against the horizon and see only what they believe. A hang-fired archivist quizzed in reverse. The penance that lesions and pustules and buboes and leaves only families withered like milkmaids in drought-stricken fields blank eyes agape at the sun, and all the ripe bodies to gather and wash clean by hand and anoint the faces to touch as the bodies are wrapped and released in the river, the fish on the stove for the meal. And so when I was writing this, I was thinking, and this is a theme that has gone through a number of poems that I've been writing recently, where I often find it useful to purposely reduce the world down into opposite poles. Uh, and quite a lot of my work recently has been focused on the poles of, uh, this is probably poorly phrased, but genius and idiocy, both intentional and unintentional, because I firmly believe that almost every one of us has the potential to be at least in small part genius, and almost every one of us has the potential to be maybe in larger part stupid, whether we know it or not. And so when it comes to disease, I had to approach this both as a poet and a folklorist, looking at what it is that people are doing and the reasons why they are doing it. And sometimes the things that they are doing are not terribly intelligent by any measure whatsoever, like the hang fired archivist quizzed in reverse. Like literally you pull the trigger, nothing happens and you turn the barrel around to see what's happening and then it explodes in your face and kills you. Um, obviously an act of idiocy there, but then ending with the families washing the bodies and moving away from COVID and going to the recent outbreaks in Africa there, where one of the reasons as so many researchers and scientists pointed out that the Ebola outbreak kept spreading in Africa was because of the local practice of washing the bodies before burial, which from one perspective is not a terribly intelligent thing whatsoever. That's how you're getting the disease. And from the other is a perfectly logical, rational explanation. Of course, you would want to wash the body and say goodbye before you put it in the ground or in the river. And then in the river, from the not intelligent perspective, the body releases bacteria into the river and the fish become infected and then you're eating the fish that the bodies came out of. So it's playing around with these poles there and, and, and trying to get a sense of a navigation of, uh, uh, of intelligence versus idiocy. Uh, and then a sort of the last comment purposely chose a, a meter that stumbles between dactylic and what's sometimes called antibacchial, the unstressed or the stressed, unstressed, stressed versus uh, stressed, stressed, unstressed, the hang fired archivist quizzed in reverse, because that meter has always felt to me like stumbling, like thinking you're at the bottom of the staircase and stepping forward, except there's one more step. And so you have to kind of jump for just a second. And I wanted the poem to feel awkward in a sense. So there's a number of things going there, just thinking about how humans behave under situations of stress in, in a pandemic. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, John. It's so fascinating. I mean, just that's the way to think in those terms. And, and um, I don't know, and then how it carries into your form. This is, this is a really, I'm so happy to hear all of the sort of stories behind the poems. Um, so thank you for that. And we're gonna move on to Suzanne. And Suzanne, in your poem, similarly, I found the images to be so vivid in the, in, in especially for this time and talking about the, this, that, the, the aliveness of nature, 
right? So for me, the, the images of the canyon wrens, the mating trills, and the grouse, particularly, I love the grouse flushed from sage. And that just open and that opening and flying, it's just gorgeous. And for me, what was remarkable of how you match that against such a difficult poem in the face of it and the it being dying. Um, so I was wondering if you could speak to that and, and your choice of, of imagery and juxtapositioning with the content. Um, I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. Thanks. Um, well, true confessions first, uh, and then I'll read the poem and then I'll talk more about it. Uh, true confessions are that uh, this poem was written before COVID. So I was really thrilled in, and you know, you guys chose it for this um, anthology. It probably fits. I will say that there's a conflation of, I lost my sister-in-law and brother-in-law within six months of each other. Um, and I was thinking a lot about death, a lot in grad school, actually. I think I lost five people while I was at Leslie. So, um, you know, when COVID hit, it was like, oh, we're just right back in this. Um, so I'll read the poem and then talk a little bit more about those tensions, the face of it. In dying, my husband doesn't wear a death mask. Think of the rock aster center, its petals plucked, the spiral of harmonies hovering close to the ground. Some days he's fog bound and I play him recordings of canyon wrens, their mating trills cascade, reminding us of plateaus and scoured cake layers of iron pressed lime and sand lichen fuzz whiskers on stone. I remember his once long strides drawing him far ahead. We used to imagine we were early explorers, startled like grouse flushed from sage by the sudden yawn of plunging crevasses, speechless as fire ants, but just as sharp living then as now in wide open territory. So I was thinking a lot about, um, you know, this juxtaposition and, and this weaving of death and life always intertwined always and one heightening the other, um, like in nature. And uh, I've spent a lot of time over the years of my life in various and sundry um, natural habitats, locations. This was a lot about being out in the desert um, around uh, Bandelier, Santa Fe, areas out there in the high desert. And also when you're outside and you don't know the place, you're always paying attention. I think your, your senses are heightened. My senses are heightened for sure. And feeling like I'm part of this, the longer I'm out there, I have a sense of being very, very small. And, um, and then there's this sense always of the time, you know, this, the layers of rock and time and maybe death is just another phase that we're moving through. And so I like to think of it that way. I try to think of it that way. Um, and being surprised by life. And, and in, even in moments when people are dying, there is this, these moments of, just the mystery of what comes next and this opening up into the, the wide open unknown. So those are probably the, if I have to explain the poem, it probably was a terrible thing to do. So, <laughs> um, I appreciate the opportunity to have uh, had my poem in here and to have had the wonderful film opportunity. That was so great, Cindy and, and Christine and Eileen, you guys have been fantastic. And I really love seeing everybody on screen again. And as uh, you know, Aaron would say, make some shit up, which is what, you know, what I feel like we've been doing, but also recording what we're living through. So thank you. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Uh, Steven Kramer, uh, you'll be up next. And you know, it strikes me that 
uh, long poems with their digressions and diversions help us feel a level of intimacy with the speaker. Um, and this poem looks out its window through various forms, illusions and narrative gestures that lead us to experience the pandemic really at its height. Um, and also to take bits of that and digest it and reflect upon it without it being reducible. Can you tell us a wee bit about the genesis of this poem and which months of the pandemic uh, that it was written? Thanks, Leslie. Yes, I can because I did homework when I got your email. <laughs> I'm not sure I could have otherwise. Um, I think, um, well, one of the things that I should say, uh, and I guess I'm saying stuff before I read it. I guess that's, I guess that's the way I'm doing it. Um, my poems these days, or at least for the last decade or so, I rarely sit down and write a poem and certainly never sit down and write a long poem. Um, I sort of pull them together from fragments that I keep on my phone more often than not now. Um, and uh, so I feel like they're sort of like, and they're like, I assemble them like Legos without instructions I've found recently. And this one may be more so than, you know, a, a one page lyric poem. Um, I look back and I think I found on my phone a line about the ass, hen the ass end of, the of a pantomime horse which I used to compare to uh, Trump to. And I think I jotted that down um, actually before the pandemic in, in, in February before, as I look at it, before my son got sent home from college uh, in like early March, I think it was. Um, and then I believe uh, I was working on it off and on starting in early April, and I believe I sent it to you, Eileen, in late May. I wasn't working on it all the time, but there was a point where I sent a version of it to my friend Joyce Pesseroff, who reads everything I write, and said, well, I wasn't bored. So I thought, okay, this seems like it's worth, because I mean, if you're gonna write something over a page, that's like litmus test one, I guess. Um, I'm just gonna read, Two, the, the two sections that seem to me the most self-contained. Um, I did want to create something, and this is sort of what you referred to, Eileen, that had a lot of different voices that feels, as you read it, kind of structured in an improvisatory way, so that it's mad sometimes, it's reflective sometimes, it's, I hope, funny sometimes, even goofy sometimes. But I did also, as I worked on it, and I talked with Joyce and Teresa Cater about this, I wanted it to get more and more unhinged, as if it were suffering from cabin fever. And that they really helped me organize it so it went that way, even though I knew the last section, which has one phrase that references COVID, and the whole rest of the poem is about, uh, section is about the end of the universe. Um, this is a section with a little title, and it's a found poem. My wife came home, Hillary came home and said, just had this incredible talk with the guy who pumps our gas at Lexington Gulf. And she told it to me and I jotted it down and it's none of this is me. Uh, and I think it's really quite beautiful. And it's not everything he said. Lexington Gulf, section eight. So now we can see our behaviors that we didn't pay attention to. We all lived in bubbles and now the bubbles are all broke open. This thing is making us stop and do some reflection instead of just going to the bar for beers before home. There's a, in a way, you learn a lot about the guy just from <laughs> that amount. He probably normally goes out for beers before he goes home, but he does go home. And then the other section that I think of is, is more or less working on its own. Uh, 
grows out of uh, my having read around in the Decameron by Boccaccio um, during COVID. And uh, this is loosely taken from the his introduction where he talks about the plague. And this part, I, I have in my phone a note that says the three approaches, and then has notes that ended up being this section. Some embrace seclusion, get two masks from one bra. Oh, I should say, there are anachronisms in this. Boccaccio doesn't mention bras in this introduction. Some embrace seclusion, get two masks from one bra, labor to touch nothing, talk to nearly no one, but not no one, shun updates, except when Burks and Fauci risk the truth. The talented perform for themselves, then it's cards or clue, astral weeks on the stereo, while infinity pounds its fists on the door. Some eat, drink, fuck night and day, sing whether or not they've got the pipes, call ventilators, breathalyzers, give shelter in place the finger, chug beer from taps in evacuated bars, annex and occupy the homes of the dying and the dead, while infinity pounds its fists on the door. Some order fever few capsules online, boil or fry peony petals, drink tincture of ginkgo and golden seal. Sick of vice or virtue and the hedges between them, the last ones know escapes the final cure and flee to the Florence of Boccaccio's time. Infinity pounding its fists at the city gates. So that's me. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you have, to, you have to read it all. <laughs> yeah, but 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 honestly, I feel like even the snippets, um, you know, sort of just like that lens in and really focusing on on the section is equally, um, I don't know, and, and compelling for me. So to hear it again and again, it's just one of those poems you just want to keep going back and sometimes just focusing on a section here and there. I love the story behind the Lexington Gulf. Um, I know where that Gulf station is, so it's kind of fun <laughs> to, to picture it. Um, so we're going to move on to Francis. And Francis, is, it, you know, some of what I've loved about this is getting to know many of you that I didn't, I wasn't at Leslie at the time that you were, and, and so to get to know you through your poetry. Um, and Francis, I, I really appreciated, um, you had three pieces that we, that we, featured here in the anthology, but I, what I'm hoping that you'll speak to, and we only have time for you to read one, and, and what, I, what I loved is how some of these poems spoke to one another without sort of knowing, and yours particularly speaks to, to Michael Mercurios, who we'll have him read, he'll follow you and here, and your opening line is just so captivating, um, <laughs> about the you know the cat doesn't care if we have to pay rent and and that just for me speaks to nature's indifference and and that was something that really struck that was startling I shouldn't say startling not the right word just really struck home with me throughout the pandemic and when we could look at as some would call a terrible beauty right that it, there's just still so much beauty beauty and and the world's still happening um, while it was hard to, to know how to appreciate that when so much sickness was happening around us. And um, anyway, so that line for me really spoke that so subtly. And I'd love to hear where that line came from for you. What was the moment? And does, you know, how does that line speak to you? And is it the same or is that different? Uh, well, thanks, Christine. Um, so, uh, Again, in the interest of full disclosure, I'll say that um, the first draft of April Merciless was written in 2014. Um, so, uh, and it's gone through a number of revisions. Um, it's it's a bit of a sonnet now, um, and um, it came from an afternoon um, when I was we we used to live in a townhouse that 
had beautiful a beautiful courtyard in the background that we shared with other townhouses in the complex. And when the weather was good, I would go out there and bring a blanket and just lay on the ground and let the cats run around. Um, and it was really idyllic. Um, but in April, what I've discovered is that there's something very odd that happens when spring comes and the sun comes out and the weather gets warmer. Before the leaves come out, I find it, it's actually, um, I always feel very exposed and it's really easy to get a sunburn that time of year. So there's this bright sunlight that's not yet like summer sunlight. It's still got that wintry edge to it. And there's no, um, there's no escape from it because there's no leaves out yet. Um, so I, I think that that was, that was very much a part of that poem. Um, and the cats don't care. I don't think that was the original first line of the poem, but it was called out to me in workshop. You know, the sounds, the, the k -k -k sounds in it. Um, and again, the idea, I mean, I think your point that it's about nature's indifference is really true. Um, and seriously, the cats don't care whether the rent goes up or not. They're really just concerned with the here and now. Um, and yeah, I mean, COVID is a perfect example of nature's indifference to us. Um, it doesn't matter whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, um, people get sick the same way, you know? Um, and people argue about it, but people get sick. Um, and um, also, if you think about it, the virus is just a very successful organism. You know, human beings are successful organisms when they reproduce, or that's one argument anyway. And so this virus was so successful because it was able to get these host bodies and reproduce and pass itself on. Um, the death of so many people was kind of incidental to that. Um, but I, 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 I mean, it's a, it's a horrific thing that's happened and I think it's changed like the nature of our country and the nature of our world. Um, but I do think that there have been some, some hidden benefits to it. Um, you know, like Stephen was saying, like Stephen quoting the guy pumping the gas in, in the previous poem, it, it, it certainly forced me to step back and reflect. And I loved that idea of how we all live in our own bubbles and the bubbles are burst open. You know, it really pointed out how interconnected we all are. So um, anyway, that's my long version. I should, uh, I should read the poem now, right? <clears throat> April, merciless. The cats don't care if the rent goes up next year. Right now, the back door is open. We tumble out. The sunlight's merciless. Mere buds on the branches. No feathers in the shade. The blue jay blares. Succulents peep green from pudding stone. I lay a blanket down. Cold filters from the ground. My head hurting in the glare. My head too open to the air. And then the final thing I'll say is just, um, you know, another other evidence of nature's indifference is that last spring, I was so awake to this incredible blooming that was happening in my neighborhood because I was going out for walks so often. And it was frankly also just a really beautiful spring as was this one. So I would just see these waves after waves of blossoms and flowers happening at the same time as like these horrific body counts were happening. And um, I, I don't think you need a clearer illustration of nature's indifference and nature continuing on no matter what us humans are doing. So thanks. Thank you, Francis. Um, yeah, I mean, that's just, it's interesting and, and same with Suzanne's poem, so these were started prior to the pandemic and yet still have such strong relevance, which, okay, then speaks moving, you know, we're going to hear from Kevin in a little bit and, and Kevin's poem speaking to ancient history and how that just, how it, it, it comes back and we, and we learn and we keep learning and it, there's relevance that just keeps coming back. And, and that's just, that's why it's, we keep telling the stories and we keep listening and we keep learning. Um, Michael, you're speaking to mercy in a cold April. So a very similar title. What I loved about your poem, what struck me, and here's another, you know, being with alum, and I had the pleasure of working with Michael during our time at Leslie and watching his poems progress. And, and so I remember where, where Michael's, you know, what they look like 
years ago and to see this poem so open right so like michael and i used to share our because we were both very like tight right and short as short as we could be we wanted to get off the page as quick as possible so he and i would just sort of be like i know we gotta write longer we gotta open up so michael it was really just lovely to see this poem and spread out and get like the turning the book now we're gonna have to like see these lengths um in a different way and so i'd love for you to speak to the form and and i guess the lines for me that that really spoke to the voice and the tone the oh patience oh patience but i felt like in addition to that re repetition the form really lent itself to this tone and voice for you and i don't know if that was conscious or not i don't know if this was an experiment for you to go long or if that's what you've been doing some more of i know you're writing longer work so if you want to speak a little bit to that that'd be great sure thank you uh christine and thank you eileen uh, both of you for including this poem in this anthology uh it, it's really wonderful to be among so many other incredible incredible poets um and you know a preponderance of leslie poets which always makes me very happy so i'm going to read the poem first and then i'm going to share my screen and talk about uh the the questions that christine has put to me so actually you know what i'm going to share my screen while i'm reading no reason you shouldn't look at it while i'm looking at it mercy in a cold april doesn't feel merciful this year's already gone, passed over by salvation and succumbing. In the part still world, turkey buzzards spoke a wheel centered on the smokestack atop Hospital Hill. And I'm cascading homeward to seal the windows, deadbolt doors into useless walls. Oh, patience, oh, patience. The only thing said meekly while we wait, it's in the air nothing settled. So in response to your questions, Christine, um, I, <laughs> I have been writing poems that take up a little bit more real estate on the page. Um, I, some of you know, I accidentally wrote a book length poem uh, from 2017 to 2019. And the sections of that poem were very squat and square and compressed. And so when I finally finished that, I started thinking actually about Andrea Reed, who isn't here tonight, but who is another wonderful Leslie poet and her graduating student seminar on the use of white space in poems. And I had played around with it a bit in grad school, but it was always an experiment I would run after the poem was finished. And then, you know, I'd play with the spacing and say, well, what does it look like if I blow it out from the center? What I started doing and what this poem is, is a part of is what my friend Jane Lunan Perel calls my disintegration poems, where the poems themselves start to unravel on the page and the breaks, the caesuras, the, the white space in the lines starts to function for me like some combination of breath and line break. And, you know, I, I think a lot about the fact that Frank Sinatra is not a very good singer in terms of the quality of his voice, but what sets him apart, and I'm probably going to be, you know, unfriended or beat up by, you know, fellow Italian Americans for this, um, but what sets him apart is his phrasing as he sings. And the whole reason he employs the kind of phrasing that he does is because Tommy Dorsey, who found Frank Sinatra and made him a star, taught Frank Sinatra to sing the way a trombone player plays trombone. So what I've started thinking about is the way the, the implication of breath in these spaces starts to function in speeding up or slowing down the poem itself. And, you know, I, I've written a bunch of poems. They don't all look exactly like this, but I've written a bunch of poems that are disintegration poems that, you know, for me in thinking about COVID, and I did write this during COVID, I did write this in April of 2020, 
um, thinking about how closely related COVID is to breath, I wanted this poem to really feel drawn out. I wanted it to feel like it was challenging the, the regular breathing of whoever was reading it. And as far as, oh patience, oh patience, I mean, aside from really liking the way it resonates on the page, um, there's also that le added resonance of, you know, people under medical care are patients. And so with the rising number of sick people in April of last year, I wanted to bring that in somehow. But the fact that it repeats and in two different places gives me what Paul Ceylon would have called a breath turn where, you know, as I'm reading it, the first O patience is O patience. And the second O patience is O patience. There's a giving up there. There's a, a change in the, the tenor and the tone of it that really spoke to my feeling of helplessness at that point. You know, I'm, I'm pretty sure, I'm not totally sure, but I'm pretty sure that around the time I wrote this, masks weren't really widely accepted and very few of us were actually using them. Um, I was because I'm paranoid and don't want to die, um, at least not from COVID. Uh, you know, struck by lightning or some other transformative death would be good, but COVID was just too sad. Um, so, you know, that's, that's where I was. And yeah, that's what I can say about that. Terrific. Thank you, Michael. Thank you so much. We always learn something new. And yes, we do. Um, Ian Reisenberg, um, many, Ian is going to be sharing some visual poetry tonight. And um, many poets, when I have a chance to talk with them, talk about writing as being a visual activity not only just starting with an image or being in the impulse of an image, but just as frequently how the words sit on the page making their own beauty and image, not only for the um, pacing, but for emphasis and actually just the idea of looking how, how the words might dance on the page or how they create a beautiful picture. Um, so I feel like visual poetry seems a logical artistic leap from concision and strong image in poetry to this visual poetry. And I'm hoping, Ian, you can share the process of creating this, this vispo. Thank you. Um... Um, and I just want to say thanks for publishing these because getting visual poems published is not an easy thing um, in the world. So I really appreciated um, that you were open to um, publishing them. Um, yeah, so um, I had been working with text and image in general, and it's really hard to, to not just be like captioning. An, an Im it's very hard to get the text and the image to be integrated and not just to feel like you know, you're writing a caption or you're, you're commenting on. Um, so I've been doing that before this happened. And then when it became real that we were in this lockdown and I remember the feeling after the 2016 election, the same feeling of that stunnedness. I remember going downtown, I lived in Portland, Maine then and going downtown and it was just quiet. You know, like the whole town was sort of in this shock of, of um, what just happened. And this came on more slowly than that, but there was still, my response to that and response to the lockdown and sort of was to slow down, you know, and think, okay, this is, this is hard. Like, what can I do? And I, I wanted to be more generous with people and kinder and more thoughtful and do the small things that I could to make a difference. And these poems sort of felt like, like how I had these words that were sort of echoing in my head, the two that you'll see, um, what I'm going to do is talk a little more and then Christine's going to screen share them and I thought we would look at them for like 30 seconds a piece just so you can absorb them. I think of them kind of as mandalas or chants or something like 
what is the repetition that allows us to go like through a doorway into thinking about um, you know what does this mean not in a in a in a you know kind of in an echoing kind of way um, and these these phrases kept showing up in my head very insistently like they'd be like um, one of them is lonely as survival, you know, and it would just be like, they just sort of showed up asking for, to be, uh, you know, made into something. And I wanted to keep it simple. And, you know, it was, I was very aware that like getting, you know, it was when we were afraid there was going to be no toilet paper and everything. So it was like, you know, finding materials to make something or going to the art supply store felt very scary and, and weird. So I didn't, so I thought, oh, I'll just build things on with word, you know, and what do I have? I have color of text. I have the shape of the final image. I have all the punctuation. And so I learned this incredible amount of about punctuation, like the emotional content of the difference between a plus sign and a, and a, you know, dots and the dashes and the short dash and the long dash and all these things. It was like, as I was figuring them out, which took an inordinately long amount of time to hone in on what worked and felt satisfying to me, like it became a, a singular object that could be contemplated. Not everything worked. I have, you know, stacks of things that didn't work, but the difference, but like there's one, I, I made about 15 of these, but one of them where the, you know, the plus sign became sort of a cross um, um, between the words. And it sort of looked like, they started looking like samplers to me or even like knitting or, um, you know, that would look like one of those military uh, cemeteries where they have all the crosses lined up, things like that. And so, and then, they would stuck in my head and then they kept going. So this loneliest survival, which I, you know, I think I wrote in, uh, you know, right at the beginning, these were all in the spring of 2020. And then I would keep thinking about them all, like it got, <laughs> the loneliness <laughs> of survival got more and more obvious as time went on, you know, so, and it was like, oh, this is just sort of brought up this, I kept thinking about it and thinking about what that meant and, 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 and the other one, I'll just say the, the language, um, which is the body will utter, will, will utter. And then I, and then that when the, when the whole murder of George Floyd happened and, and there was all that, you know, him saying mother, this sort of came out of his body as he was dying. And I just thought, yeah, like totally like those, the, the um, racial intensity and the pandemic really kind of merged for me in terms of feeling states and that, so we were having these bodies uttering and it was all in the sort of the breath and the chest and sort of these expressions. And it was like, yes, you know, a body at the point of death will utter. And a lot of that wasn't heard because people were alone when they were dying. And so it just, I think just started ricocheting around and, um, and I just sat with them and, and just used these phrases and tried to construct something uh, with the very simple tools within word to make it make sense and give it a wholeness. So they weren't just words repeating, they were, became a something you know, like a whole thing that what you, and I don't, I'm not going to read them because it would be silly <laughs> to just say the same words over and over again, but I'm hoping in looking at them that there is, I've created some kind of access into a, you know, a more contemplative, um, which is for me, Francis, what you were saying, the benefit of this year for me has been a slowing down and an ability to kind of like breathe and not be social. And as an introvert, it was sort of a huge relief to not have to go anywhere <laughs> without the pressure, you know? And so it was like, oh, like what, how do I understand myself without all these distractions? And how do I feel more deeply? Because I'm pretty sure that if we all were able to feel more deeply, we wouldn't make, continue to make the same mistakes over and over again, quite so brutally. So um, yeah, so I think that's, that's what I wanna say about that. And thank you, Christine, for doing the hard work of screen sharing for me so I didn't have to learn something new with, with my adult hot pollen infested brain. Um, thank you. I know it seems so silly because I messed it up another time, but I won't this time. And Michael, no, it's, it's fine. I just so appreciate it really not having to learn something new at this very moment. <laughs> I appreciate that. Do we want to go 30 seconds on one and then go right into the other one? Or did you sure. I think, I think, you know, I, I think so. And yeah. Okay. And 30 right. seconds may feel like an eternity, and I'm sorry about that, but that will tell us something about how we relate to time, too, which is useful. Okay. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you. Now, that was wonderful. I mean, I almost didn't want to stop sharing sharing the screen because I felt that yeah. it was had there was this contemplation and this sense of meditation and this like particularly with the second poem for me. Um, but that was wonderful. Go ahead, Eileen. Yeah, that was really powerful. Um, I also wanted to say for those of you who do um, work with visual poetry, starting in issue seven, Lily Poetry Review will have a VizPo editor named Suzanne Mercury, who um, knows a lot of um, and works with visual poetry with people around the globe. So it should be exciting to see hmm. some more visual poetry and Anne send stuff our way. Thank you. I will. <laughs> Thank you. That's really exciting news. So now we'll move on to Kevin. And again, how poetry, how poems are speaking to one another. When Anne spoke about the crosses, I'm like, that leads perfectly into my question for Kevin. Um, I had a few questions. I was reminded, I was telling Kevin that I was listening to a um, podcast. It was Dr. Jill Tarter. She's a um, astronomer and speaking about history. Now, someone had asked, well, why is it important if we get messages from the aliens? It's going to be light years past, like it's going to be past information. And she's like, well, no, we're still learning that just like we learned from the Greeks, the Tradigians, as Kevin points out, we learned from Shakespeare what it was like in England. So that just was like, was like, that's what Kevin is sort of getting at. But that isn't the question I wanted to go to. I was fascinated by the use, his use of the cross, Kevin, your use of the cross as a section break. And I know it was purposeful because everything you do when you're writing, we all, you know, it's purposeful, but I'd love to know, like for me, it became a connector versus like here is it's a break serving as a break. But for me, it was also serving as a connector. I almost kept reading it like an ampersand and I'd read it and and then and it would just keep me going and then there's also just the historical relevance and symbolism of a cross and for me that was very powerful so there was just so much about that small little cross that just blew this poem up for me and I'd love to hear um how that came out for you that'd be great Sure. So I, I can answer that, and then I'll I'll read the poem quickly. Um, you know, it's something I've been doing for years in in poems. Um, I think maybe for the last five books. So it wasn't particular to this poem, though. I I really love that it resonated in that very particular way in this poem. Um, that's that's kind of exciting to hear. Um, I started doing it uh, maybe twenty years ago with with very frequently because I had this idea that um, I was writing long poems, long narrative poems that were sort of constructed out of what felt like smaller, shorter lyric poems. So that the sort of series of lyric poems would add up to a narrative and um, that each section of a poem was sort of in addition to the previous section. And as I did this, it also helped me write. It helped me think like, well, at the end of the poem, there's a sort of invisible equal sign, right? Um, so this invisible equal sign that as I was thinking of my own writing, I was, would be asking myself, well, what the hell does it all equal in this poem? And then, so what, you know, what began as a sort of trick to help me, to help me write and help me think about writing and help me sort of paraphrase for myself what it was I was after became something that I incorporated into my work and published that way. Um, and now I'm really fussy about it. Um, magazines are often wanting to replace them with little flowers or whatever their little doohickey is that they, they have in their magazine. And I always write and say, oh, please, can you just not, not put flowers? It's really part of the poem. So thanks for not putting flowers in. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, read, I'll read the poem, which, um, uh, which began by thinking about you know, how metaphors sort of always become insubstantial after a while. Right, like every metaphor is true until it's false. Um, my love is a rose is true, you know, I guess. I mean, it's red and has thorns or whatever the hell. Um, but then when you think about it, you think, well, it's not actually a plant, you know. Um, like the more you examine the metaphor, the more it becomes, becomes false. So I, I kind of played that game with this poem of examine, examining a metaphor. The one I'm gonna read is just slightly different from the one in the book because I can't help fussing with things. So um, it's called In This Way. 
there probably was a Trojan War, a skirmish between small rival towns, but we only receive its echoes in literature. Facts about the battle are obscure, endlessly transformed by the Greek tragedians. In this way, the war lives deep in history, seemingly overwhelmed by stories. In this way, a virus hides in an urban population, replicating itself before breaking through. At first, we should avoid crowds, we should wash our hands. In this way, the virus is an ancient story changing itself all the time to suit our environment. It is a dynamic story evolving to suit the genetic complexities of its audience. In this way, the Trojan War lives deep in the cells of Greek literature and is also transformative. So now we are closing our schools. We are shutting down the theater district. In this way, crowds and transmission. The problem with the metaphor implicit in this poem is that the germ of the Trojan War helped the Greeks understand themselves and has, and has helped me understand them, no matter that the battle itself remains forever of small geographical importance. A virus in the population among, let's face it, people I love, will emerge to a vastly different result. In this way, the germ of memory is not an actual germ. In this way, the nurses who might, for instance, tend to you will adjust their masks before they enter your room. How are we doing today, they'll ask, though they know you are dying. Doing the best we can, I'm thinking here in the past, looking out my window onto the dark street. Thank you. It's beautiful. Um, thank you so much. And thank all of you for your contributing this amazing work um, and to have it all in, in bound together is, is such a pleasure. And um, the next up is Cindy Hunter Morgan. And Cindy, um, I love that you use the epistolary form, you know, sending a message to look for a message. Can you tell me a little bit about why you chose that form? And then I know you'll read the poem and we'll show the film clip. And we want to thank you too for for this amazing um, opportunity to work with MSU um, on the film filmetry project. Well, thank you, Eileen, and thank you, Christine, and thank thank you all. It is such a pleasure to sort of feel gathered together again. And uh, I don't know, I was sort of sitting down the stairs before the reading, feeling like. I was back in Cambridge a little bit. So thanks for giving me that feeling again. Um, so your question about the epistolary form, I, um, probably a few ways to begin answering that. Uh, I, I, I love paper and I love mail and I, I love the analog. So, uh, so therefore I love the epistolary form, but I love the epistolary form for other reasons too. I, I appreciate the way that um, the form lets you kind of speak to the whole world while you pretend to speak to one person or the way it lets you speak to one person while you're pretending to speak to the whole world or the way it lets you speak to or pretend to speak to one person while you are really speaking to another person. Um, so I, I love that they're sort of simultaneously private and public. And I appreciate how you, how they sort of permit a kind of immediate intimacy with somebody you otherwise have no way to really connect with. Um, so they dissolve history, chronology, they totally interrupt time in the way they facilitate this kind of communication between people who can't possibly know each other. So, um, so in that way, I, I, I like how they, 
how they juggle absence and presence and um, and sort of dissolve traditional notions of absence and presence. I think it's a great exercise in thinking about how you can establish tone because it's what we do when we communicate with somebody. Um, so, you know, tone is an important part of any poem and it feels particularly easy to manipulate in an epistolary form. So I appreciate it for that. Um, what else? I just love how that, that I, mean, I love reading epistolary forms because I feel like I'm eavesdropping. And who doesn't love like finding the note that you're not supposed to find and reading it? I feel like I'm intercepting something. So I, I really love that about epistolary poems. And, um, and I should say that the, 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 the Johnny Cash poem is really part of a larger project. And it began with Emily Dickinson, which is only right, right? And all of her letters and poems and envelope poems. Um, I started writing to Emily Dickinson a few years ago. And then because I, I, have, I have taught uh, book arts many years at MSU, um, I started turning those letters into books. I mean, I'm um, sort of exploding the notion of what a traditional book is, but I took the letters I wrote Emily and I bound them into an accordion structure. <laughs> uh, and so that you can, you know, they're tactile. You can pull the letters out and read them. Um, so three, if you want to read, three of these are uh, up on, to Dear Emily, are up on Passages North. Um, I wrote to Audubon. One of those Audubon letters is up at Contrary Magazine. And it's just a delight to have one Dear Johnny Cash letter um, in this anthology. And so really great to share pages with all of you special people. So, um, Dear Johnny Cash. Dear Johnny Cash, were you really the first American to hear that Stalin died? Is it true the message came by Morse code, which you decoded? That could make any man a little bit famous or famous for a few minutes on Jeopardy. But I've heard it was you who would become famous anyway. Is that too much fame for one person? It's not my most important question. What I really want to know is what it felt like, that moment when you held the information in your ears, your head, your tongue. What did it taste like? Not candy, not cough drop or cake frosting, pepper, maybe pepper, spice and surprise, but maybe that's not quite right either. And that's not even really why I'm writing. It's raining here, we're quarantined. I keep listening to the patter and taps and drips, which might be Morse code. Hardly anybody knows that anymore. We're all desperate for a message, but we're not sufficiently trained to hear it. We need you, Johnny Cash. Sincerely, Cindy. Thank you very much, all of you friends. And I, I thanks for this clip that you'll share, this it's a short film made by Peter Johnston. Um, uh, Pete and I are co-founders of the MSU Filmetry Festival and it was really wonderful to work with this anthology. Were you really the first American to hear that Stalin died? Is it true the message came by Morse code, which you decoded? That could make any man a little bit famous. Or famous 
for a few minutes on Jeopardy, but I heard it was you who would become anyway. Much fame for one person. felt like that moment when you held the information in your ears, with your head. What did it taste like? Not candy, not cough drop or cake frosting. Spice and surprise. Maybe that's not quite what I mean. It's not even really why I'm writing. It's raining here. We're quarantined. I keep listening to the patter. Perhaps. Nobody knows that anymore. We're all desperate for a message. Thank you all. This was a nice event. It was a nice yeah. event. Thank you guys for organizing yeah. it and for putting Thank together you. this anthology. I think you've really created a whole community around it. I mean, there was one already, but you did it. So we're very grateful to have all of this work. And, you know, I, I think I'll co come back to this again and again over the years. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank everyone for being here. Thank you, Christine. Yeah, thank you, Eileen. Thank you, everybody. It really was a treat um, just to hear us all kind of coming together and reading poetry and hearing of your thoughts behind it all. And really, we really appreciate it. And on behalf of, of Cambridge Common, thank you, Christine. Thank you, Eileen. Uh, thank you, poets, for, for sharing your work. Uh, if you enjoyed hearing our alums tonight, and our mentors in the form of Stephen and Kevin read and talk about their work. We hope you'll check out the calendar on cambridgecommonwriters.org because we've got a lot of other events coming up this month, uh, including a number with fiction along Cheney Kwok, who's promoting his new book, The Passenger. Uh, he's actually going to be speaking with Daniel Handler, also known as Lemony Snicket, tonight at 9 p.m. and you can find the details on our calendar. So please do check in with Cambridge Common frequently because we've always got cool stuff going on. If you haven't already joined Cambridge Common and you're a Leslie MFA grad, reach out to us and we would love to have you be part of it. So thanks again and uh, we'll see you at the next event.